Hi, welcome everybody to the EdCollab Gatherings workshop number four, brought to you by our Chatham teachers, um, Heather Rocco, Jen A uh, Agents, Christina Fallon, Christina McCabe, and Cindy Gagliard, who will be talking to you today about independent reading at the secondary level. We're going to start off today with Heather Rocco. Well, Over good you, morning. Heather. Thank you, Carolyn, and welcome, everyone. We're so excited to be here today to share with you our love and passion for reading and how we have transferred that and brought that into our classrooms and shared it with our students. Um, so we're very excited. So thank you, Carolyn, again. Thanks to the Ed Collab for having us, and thanks to my amazing, fantastic teachers um, who are joining us today. So, so excited to be doing all of this work with you. Um, as we present um, our work today, and we'll start skipping forwards on slides there, we are going to be um, hoping to interact with you, so feel free if you want to tweet to us. We are going to um, keep an eye on our Twitter feed, so we can, if you want to ask us questions, feel free to do so. Those are our handles there. We also have um, put the hashtag there. We are session number four, um, so you can include that, and um, we'll pop in with and answer your questions as we um, go along. So we're looking forward to a conversation as well as a presentation. Okay, so here we go. So uh, about three years ago, we made a decision to embrace reading and um, really make it a vital, important part of our instruction in ways that we hadn't done in the past. This is what our classes look like at the first 10 minutes of almost every day in both our middle school and our high school. And we found that um, it's unusual, perhaps, to start class this way um, in high schools in particular, but we have seen such a tremendous difference in our students and in their love of reading because of this just 10 minutes of work um, that they're doing. So every day, class starts this way. You'll see in that photo, we've got kids reading books. We've got the teacher. Um, Shout out to Ferg in the front there reading um, his book. And um, we've got the books that the students have in their hands are books that they chose. Um, and it sets a great tone. And we're going to tell you how we got to this point today. So why independent reading? Well, I've had the benefit of working in lots of um, elementary schools and you see students in elementary school loving books and they're reading all these different texts um, and sharing books and they're so excited to be readers and then we saw as students get older we actually give them less time to choose their books um, and no surprise their love of reading and their engagement in reading diminishes and so we see that as our mission that diminish, but to actually accelerate it and get them excited about reading all different types of books and embracing the reading that they love um, to do and that, um, the books that they love to read. So um, that's why it is so, so important to us. We have found that, of course, when we assign books, and we still do, still do teach um, books and whole class novels and in book clubs, but when we assign a book like Gatsby, which we all love, but when we say it's a great book, kids tend to say, oh, I don't think so, um, just because we said it was a great book. But if we say, well, what do you want to read, the kids are more apt to say, hmm, well, let's see, and go on a search to find a book that they'll love. And of course, we help them. We're going to tell you all about that. Um, so we've decided as a department that our most important goal is for students to leave high school readers and seeing themselves as readers as well. Um, so that's why we've made it our mission. We love Penny Kittle. <laughs> um, and so Penny has a great quote which is up here on the, on the screen um, but that really says that it is just not too late it is never too late to engage students in books and to help them find what they love and we believe that um, and live that and even when we have students in our classrooms who can't find the right book yet we continue to make it our charge to help them find the right book because we do believe that just getting the right book into kids hands as Kylene Beer says too can spark their love um, of reading forever. Um, so Penny is our inspiration and um, we began this work three years ago by um, sharing her book. So Penny has a book called Book Love. I think that's the next slide, Christina. 
Oh, no. Sorry. The next slide. Sorry, Christina. No, the next slide is do your homework. Um, so as we begin this work, see, it's fine. We just roll with it. Um, as we begin this work, it is important for you, before you jump into your independent reading program, that you do your own homework because you will have people who are doubters and people who think that maybe it's not the best use of your time to have students reading in front of you or to talk to them about books that they've chosen, young adult books and you know sci-fi books and all of that. Um, so it's important to do your homework so that you know the research behind this and how it makes a huge difference to students um, when they have choice and voice in what they have the opportunity to read. So in doing your homework, now we can move forward to the next slide. Our favorite person uh, is Penny Kittle. And we started this work um, with Penny's book as well as Donalyn Miller's book, The Book Whisperer, was really influential, particularly at the middle school level. But in uh, three or four years ago, I purchased a copy of this book for every member of the department and gave it as a summer read. It was optional. Um, and lots of people took us up on it. And really asked people to think about how might this work in your classroom. I had been doing it in my own classroom for several years, um, and I saw the difference that it made for students. So the department was fantastic and excited and um, embraced that opportunity. They read over the summer. I would get emails like, oh, what if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? Um, and uh, when we came back for that first meeting that September, I included in that department meeting as our opening a video that Penny has, um, which the link is there, and I'm tweeting out the link as well, um, so you can watch it, that shows her students and their um, thoughts about reading and why they weren't reading. And as the department watched that video, we saw our own students in, on that screen, you know, that the same kids who were faking reading or kind of skimming reading, and they weren't really engaging in the text. But when Penny gave them the opportunity to read the books that they loved, we wanted to do the same. And so that's how our independent reading initiative was born. When you um, read Book Love or The Book Whisperer, you will find it is so exciting and there are so many things to do but you can't do it all in the first um, step. So we do um, suggest that you start small <laughs> um, and not try and um, get everything done all at once here. Um, oh, sorry, Christina, let's go back to that one slide. I forgot to write that one down. What we loved about this video is th there's a student in Penny's video that said, well, she asked him the question, what can your English teacher do to get you to read more? And the student's reply is, let me read better books. Um, so. <laughs> Their view of better books might differ from what we might think are better books, but that's okay because we want them to be reading. Okay, so now we're going to start small. Sorry, Christina. And um, don't try and be Penny Kittle in your first month or week or even your first year. Instead, just find the time and make the time for reading in your classroom. Help students find the right books that they'll want to read, things that they'll be excited to read, things that they'll find that they can't put down um, because that will influence their reading life and help them to see themselves as a reader. So build then, assess as it's going along to see what does work, what doesn't work, um, and then you can slowly scaffold. We are three years in uh, to this um, work that we're very, very excited about, of course, and we're still learning on um, ways to um, make it even better. So, uh, and which you're going to hear all about right now um, from all the fabulous teachers before you. So I am going to pass it off to Chris Fallon, who's going to talk about the key components for um, our independent reading program. Chris. Hi. Um, I want to talk to you today a little bit um, just about this idea of five minutes matter. Just go, yeah, go ahead one slide. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about um, structure and purpose. Um, I think it's very important um, as you take on this project within your school that you have some type of structure in place that everyone's on board with. And we thought it was very important that from freshman year to sophomore year to junior year to senior year, all of the English teachers were on board in terms of using this um, program as a do now in the classroom. And the kids are very used to it. They love the consistency of it. They know that when they come in in the morning, they have five minutes to read, to settle in. And 
everyone's on board with it without within our department. And I think as you start to think about how it's going to work within your school and within your department, um, everyone is on board, but you can kind of angle it your own way, which I think is really nice. In terms of the five minutes, some teachers like to set a timer. And the kids know they have five minutes, they put it up on the smart board, and after that five minutes, they, they transition into whatever they're doing in the classroom. I tend to be a little bit more free form with it. I, I think it has to be a routine. I'm very definitive about that. I let them read every single day when they come in. If I'm a little bit behind, which I am sometimes, it might only be for five minutes. Sometimes when they're really into it and I can see that every child is really enjoying what they're doing, it might be 15 minutes. But we read every day and everyone has their own procedure with that, which I think is really great. Um, I think the next thing that is, is important when you think about how you're going to institute this in your classroom is how you're going to set it up. Um, some teachers, especially for younger children, and we have some freshman teachers in the building that um, might use carpet squares. If you have a larger classroom, it's nice to give them the mobility to move around. They're sitting at a desk all day long. So if your classroom allows for that, it's really nice for them to pick a corner or just not sit in a desk. Not every child wants to sit in a desk all day long and they kind of feel um, that's very regimen and if, if your classroom allows for you to do that, I'm, I'm all for that. I think it's great. Some of the older kids, you know, it, it might not be for them, but I think it, you need to be thoughtful about that, about how you want to set up your classroom because it just makes for a nicer environment for the students. I think in terms of structure and, and expectations, and we'll talk about assessment later in the presentation, but I think there should be some types of expectations just in terms of conversation more than evaluation. I think the students really want to talk about what they're reading. Sometimes after we read, I'll just say, hey, turn and talk. Tell the person next to you what you're reading, why you like it, what you don't like about it. I don't think everything you're reading, let's face it, has to be something that you loved, loved, loved. Sometimes you really want to share how passionate you are about it, or maybe you want to pass on that this isn't, isn't a great selection for everyone in the class. I do require that my students do a book talk once a year. I just think it's a nice form of oral presentation. They're getting up and talking about something that they really love. So it's something that I use in the classroom in terms of this conversation that we're having about what we're reading. Um, page counts. A lot of teachers like this idea of page counts, which I do, but I don't like it to turn into any type of competition. I don't think that speed of reading has anything to do with quality of reading necessarily, but I always, I kind of try to liken everything to things that I like, so I liken it to, I liken it to running. I like to run. I run in races. I'm never going to win a race ever. But I like that each time I run, maybe my time is a little bit better. So a child that maybe the first month is only able to read 150 pages by the latter part of the year, if they're reading 200 pages, that's a personal best for them. And I think they like to see how they are increasing and becoming better readers. So I think those types of choices that you make in terms of evaluation are important, what you want to institute in your classroom. Um, the last thing, and we're going to talk about this a lot in terms of structure, is making books available. You have to have a library in your classroom. That's imperative. Kids will come in all the time and say, I just finished a book. I don't like what I'm reading. You don't want them sitting there for 10 minutes with nothing to do. So building your library, having a great library, having choices, getting to know your students as readers is very important because you want to have the appropriate books in your classroom. All right, I want to talk a little bit about communicating. I attended a conference a few years back that just made a huge impression on me, and it was, um, it was presented by William Daggett, and he talked about rigor, relevance, and relationships. And I think a big part of this program is the relationships you're building, not with only the students, but their parents as well. Because within Chatham, we like to look at ourselves as a community of readers. So it's us as educators, it's the parents, it's the children, it's building this idea that we are a community of readers. When I do back to school night every year, I put every book that I've read over the summer on a table, and that's how I start my presentation. I show the parents what I've read, how I've challenged myself, the fun things I've read, to let them know that, yes, I'm a reader, and I love to read, and these are the things that I'm sharing with your children. I think it's important for them to be doing that as well in their home. So if we build this relationship with the parents that we are a community of readers, I think that it's cer certainly very important to do right off the bat. 
Um, I also have a link on my teacher page with um, recommendations and I try to update that two or three times a year because I think it's very important that you're suggesting not only to the students but to the parents as well. And I get emails from parents all the time, I read such and such, oh I loved it, thanks for recommending it. So I think it's another way that you can just open yourself up to the parents as well as a community of readers that we're building within your school and what we've been working on here at Chatham in Chatham. I also do book talks myself at least once or twice a month depending on how fast I read something but I like to share what I'm reading with the students and also model a book talk for them. I think it's important to always keep open these lines of communication so we can talk about what we've read. The other, the next thing I want to talk about just a little bit is, is this idea of mindfulness and I think this plays into relationships as well because we know we're educators but we're also there to be, have a social awareness of our students in general. And we are educating in a time where, where students are under tremendous amounts of stress. Um, the rigor in the high schools that we teach in are top notch. I think what this program does and what has been very evident for me is create a sense of security for the kids. If, you, if they've had a horrible rush morning and they're running into school and they don't want to be tardy, they can sit down for 10 minutes and take out something they love and read a book and start their day in a much more relaxed environment than taking out a worksheet and having to go into something right away. We provide them with this opportunity to relax and work on something that they really, really enjoy. I think it's really important, these transitions between classes, they might be coming from taking just a really arduous test and they know that when they walk into your classroom, they can take out their books and decompress and just relax for two seconds and I think that's a really important, important part of the program. The idea of stamina I think is super important and I go back to my running analogy a lot um, but I share with my students at the very beginning of the year um, an excerpt from Malcolm Gladwell's book The Outliers and um, in it at the very beginning he says that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything and I think a lot of students look at reading just as something they can do. They don't understand to some degree that it's actually a skill and I'll always say anyone can run but great runners practice all the time and I've had a lot of students say to me oh you do two or three book talks a month you read fast because you're a teacher and I'm like I don't read fast because I'm a teacher I read fast because I read all the time and they'll start to see that in their own skill that they will become better readers that they're comprehending more that they can sit for longer periods of time so um, we also have seen students that say that they've had seen improvements in their ACTs and SATs and if that's something that organically can come out of this wonderful program then it's a win-win for everyone which is really great. Um, and lastly going into my last point we as educators never like to think that we teach to a test um, but I think the connections and the things we're doing in our independent reading program have really allowed the children to blossom as um, readers and we have seen here at Chatham um, within the first couple of years that we instituted the program our, um, our student scores really really improved and again it's not something that was intentional necessarily but if we can use a program that they love and something that they're really enjoying then then we see an end program where they actually are bringing those skills to higher level thinking then again it's a win-win situation for everyone so um, the program has really taken off and I think it is really important to think about these things as you're structuring the program within your own school so I'm going to turn it over to Jen now and she's going to talk a little bit more about how you can build your library which is an important component of the program and I'm just going to pop in really quick. We had a question from Rebecca uh, Marsik on Twitter that asked how many people um, are in our department and if our, we have leveled classes or heterogeneous classes. So we have um, 12 teachers at the high school, 12 teachers at the middle school. Our classes are leveled beginning in the seventh grade. We have an honors level um, and then a regular level. So I hope that's helpful. Feel free to keep asking questions too. Go ahead, Jen. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jen. I teach middle school um, and one of the 
challenges I think that we see in the middle school is getting our kids to read. Starting in sixth grade, they are presented with a lot of opportunity to socialize and play sports and do all these other really great things. So how do we get them interested in reading? Well, I think it needs to start with our classroom libraries. And if you have a diverse classroom library where the kids can really pick new, popular, interesting titles, you'll get them to read. Um, and reading doesn't become a chore, it's something that they love to do. So in the next slide, uh, one of the ways our, our department in the sixth grade, I should say, started our book love and helping kids read was to apply for a grant. Um, to get them to read, you need to have books in the classroom. So our school and our district in general offers a lot of great opportunities to apply for grants. So my colleagues and I wrote a Building a Community of Readers um, book grant, and what we did was we needed to make sure we applied for the right type of grant, so we had to research what's available to us, um, what requirements do we need to meet, what sort of research do we need to do to compile um, a solid list of books, uh, appropriate titles to offer our sixth graders. Um, we went through different vendors to get the best prices available, compiled it into a spreadsheet. Uh, we also researched purchasing bookshelves, um, checkout systems. So in the slide you see uh, we have a lockbox to keep our checkout cards and you know different color uh, library cards and we have library pockets to help us manage what books are taken out of our classroom libraries. Um, but anyway, so we account for all of these things, lamination products, the book cards, so forth, and put that into a grant. Just to give you a figure, we got just over 200 books, laminating products, book cards, uh, and our, the rest of our checkout system for just $2,200 for three teachers. So it was a small grant, but it got us a lot of product, and it's, it's made reading all the difference in our classrooms. The kids are checking out books left and right and it's just it's been a wonderful year seeing kids with books in their hands. Not every teacher though is able to apply for a grant so what do you do? Buy books on your own. Um, I know it's hard you you don't always have the biggest budget but you can go to a garage sale pick up some books there. Um, a lot of schools offer book fairs um, so you buy books there. A lot of, like in our school, for instance, the um, librarians put up signs where parents can donate books to their child's library. So it's a, su a suggestion that you can maybe coordinate with your library specialist to um, get books donated to your classroom on your behalf. Um, a lot of times, students will finish reading a book and donate it to their to their own teacher's classroom, and then that book is there forever for other future students to enjoy. Um, you can, of course, buy books online, like Amazon.com. Um, you can see what kind of school budgeting your had, uh, your what kind of budgeting your school has. So I know our supervisor every year accounts for purchasing some books for our independent reading libraries. Um, I always share my own books. So after I finish reading uh, a young adult lit book, I put it into my classroom library. Um, Again, applying for a grant or even going to a used book sale, maybe at a local library, uh, college, so forth and so on. So that's just another opportunity. One of the other things that I think is super important in getting the books into the kids' hands is knowing what to read. You need to promote your community of readers. So when I'm done reading a book, I advertise it. I put it uh, behind my desk at school. I have a, a whiteboard that says what I'm currently reading so that the kids are interested. We can have conversations about the books that I'm reading and they're reading because we see what we're reading with one another. Um, another opportunity for you is to um, have the students promote their books, have them do book talks, um, post things in your classroom, do digital uh, posting, um, have a checkout system. That way you can kind of keep inventory of what it is your students are reading. If you see that, I don't know, Percy Jackson is really popular, maybe next year you can order a couple extra copies so that 
more kids can circulate it uh, and read it and then of course talk about it with each other. That's the whole idea of this um, is to get them talking and reading and enjoying what they're reading. Um, in my next slide I have a couple uh, pictures to show how I promote reading in my classroom. So after I finish reading a book or if we get a new book donated, I put it right on top of my, uh, my marker ledge and I write new to our classroom library to show the kids we're getting new stuff all the time. Um, my students also, I teach sixth grade, so it's a nice visual way to show how much we're reading. We have books, uh, sticker charts, so every time we finish a book, we put up a sticker. And then, personally, what I do each time I finish reading is I rank my book on my own book log, and I, I tell the kids how much I've enjoyed it by ranking it with a star. So that's been a really positive way of increasing reading in my own classroom. And another way to make sure that we are successfully building our classroom libraries is to make meaningful recommendations. A lot of times the kids don't know what to pull off the shelves um, or they're you know, not sure what they're interested in. They just finished reading a book. What do they move on to next? Um, some of the ways to, to know how to help the kids is to read what they're reading. If you're not reading literature that's appropriate for their age group, it will be difficult. Um, I always show the kids what I'm reading, and I can't tell you how many times they turn around and say, can I check out that book? Are you done with it yet, Mrs. Asian? So we share our reading with experiences with each other. Um, it's really important that the students get time to make recommendations also. Sometimes you won't have a book in your library, but kids know of great books and want to share them. So where you, you need to give them the opportunity to be able to have those conversations. Um, speaking of not having books in your library, you want to develop time or carve out time in your day to bring kids to your school's library so that they can check out what's on the shelves there, have the library specialists help you um, make recommendations to the children. Uh, have them sit in the library in big comfy chairs and, and read uh, all the new great literature that's being published. Um, and I, I think if you're able to start small, get some books available, get current books available, um, you know, it, it makes a big difference uh, for the students. They'll want to read if you make books available to them. And on that note, I'd like to turn it over to our good friend Cindy to talk about assessment of independent reading. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for letting us be with you. Um, I want to just start by referencing what Heather had mentioned about the video that she showed us at our opening department meeting, because what really struck me about that was the kids were just talking about the volume and volume of books that they had read. and how it was incredible how kids who claimed to have read one book through four years of high school had then read 20 books um, of their own choosing. And something in that video clip that wasn't touched on was forms of assessment. And I think when you sit down to decide as a department or as individuals how you're going to approach this, that part of it has to be part of the conversation. And I think that you come down to a central point where you have to decide what's our focus here and what would be the purpose of assessing them. So for me, I spent a lot of time jockeying around about how I felt about that. And as we went through it with our first year, I made a pretty conscious decision um, not to formally assess. So if we can go to the first slide. Um, I think there are some core questions that you have to ask of yourself in terms of what your rationale is. And I think you have to define the reasoning for your department's acceptance of independent reading. And if you're deciding that we just want to get them to get that sense that we all have as adults, that we just want to be part of this larger community of readers, and you see people on the beach reading a book or a man on a train reading a book, and if that love of literature is what you want to cultivate, then perhaps assessment isn't something that you want to explore. So I think you have to make sure that whatever you do, it's in line with your purpose for, for adopting a program like this. I think there has to be this understanding that whatever the children will produce, if it's anything about assessment, that it has to be authentic and there has to be some sort of organic flow to the assessment in terms of connecting with the book and why the kids wanted to read the book in the first place. I think our kids are smart, no matter their middle school, high school kids, they're going to be able to sniff it out if you're doing something 
that you're couching as something fun for them to do in terms of just getting to love a book when you're really going to give them a test on it. And they, they see that. So I think the organic nature of what comes from it is something that's really important. I also think that it needs to promote sharing. I think a few of my colleagues have touched on this notion of community and collaboration and talking with each other and book talking. And I think that sharing has to have a home somewhere. And it doesn't necessarily has to be have to be an assessment for sharing. You can just have a conversation, like Chris had referenced, the turn and talk, or talk about a book uh, that you're currently reading, whether you like it or not. Just to have that communication, I think, is very important. You don't want to suck the joy out of what we're asking them to do. And sometimes formal assessment can do that. The last comment on this particular slide about would a real reader do it, it's something we reference in our department. We talk to each other about it. Obviously, lots of published authors have referenced this comment. Um, and that's something that's so important, because we have to get across to them that notion that reading is not just something you do in school. It's not something that's formal all the time. And again, that notion that you see other people around you reading books. Book clubs are there because your first instinct when you read a book is you want to tell somebody about it. You want to have conversation about it. And that's something that's really essential to this. It can't feel forced. So I think in deciding whether you're going to assess or not, that's really your platform. So if you're thinking, this is something I just want to step into to have kids love reading, and I don't want to go down that assessment road, I think some questions you need to ask yourself. First of all, will the kids even take it seriously if they don't have something at the end of the road where you are going to assess or ask them questions or ask them to do something? And I think depending on the motivated level of your classes, that question might have a different answer. Um, I think depending on your approach and your rapport with your students, I think how you sell it, that, that answer could differ as well. Um, but I think, again, going back to that idea, we've, we've got to you know, push that love of reading. Will they still engage in it if it's something that won't be assessed? And fundamentally, something you need to look at is, can you justify this to your administration and say, this is 10 minutes of my instructional time. That time is precious. Can I still do this? And I think that's, that's a logistical question. That's not a bad question to make sure that you take a look at. I think if you decide that you, oops, did we skip a do assess? I think we missed a slide in there somewhere, um, about deciding if you do want to assess or not. It may be the previous slide, Heather. No? No? OK. Maybe I'm, I'm sorry. My bad. Um, in terms of, let's go back a slide. I'm sorry. I'm jumping on. There we go. Um, in terms of ideas for some sort of casual but still formalized terms of assessment, ideas that I know some things Christina is going to be talking about in a minute, um, having them post reviews on Goodreads, or I think something that Jen does, she uses Padlet, which is, again, a, like a community idea, a way to post some sort of a book review. Um, a, we use Schoology in our high school, which is formatted much like Facebook. And we use that as a platform for sharing. Um, and sometimes you can have kids do a Schoology post. And those are ways where you can assess whether or not the student has read the book. But it's something that's not threatening. Pros and cons to this. Um, Will anyone ever read it once it's up there? Uh, what I've done uh, this year, I teach juniors and seniors, is once a marking period, I've actually taken class time to say, OK, instead of reading today, we're going to spend 10 minutes. And I want you to go on Schoology, read, and comment on at least one other book review. So that somehow they're, they're interacting with it, and it hasn't just been posted, and then it's just sitting out there forever, and nobody actually accesses it. Um, something that's tough, too, is it's very copy and paste attractive, uh, that kids can go to another site. You can go to barnesandnoble.com, or you can get somebody else's review of the book, and you can pass it off as your own. And then really, have you been able to assess if, if the student has read the book or not? A positive to, to doing uh, ideas like this and having posting reviews is that it's a style of writing that we're reinforcing, that um, it's summary writing. It's You could um, do something where you're writing as a reporter, and you go through the who, what, where, when, why. Um, you can talk about suspense writing in that way and teach kids how to give enough hints to try to draw somebody in without actually giving away the end of the book. So I think in terms of a positive approach to doing something smaller like that, I think it, it reinforces different kinds of writing, which I think is good. I think part of the conversation, too, needs to be this difference between evaluating 
and assessing. And I think we can evaluate the degree to which our kids are engaged in their books without necessarily attaching a grade to it. And some of the images you see on the screen right now, those were taken from some of uh, Chris's students who offered them an option um, to do a visual version of the book or a cover, some sort of visual representation. So you can see, first of all, the talent on those three is incredible. Uh, the bottom right one, you have more of a collage approach to the book. And then you have A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which is just an amazing visual rendering of that. And then Perks of Being a Wallflower on the left there with just this spectacular uh, blossom of flowers as the head of the person. So I think you learn something about your students also when you give them an opportunity to do that. We don't get to see that our students are artists like that all the time. So I think that's another bonus to that. Um, in using technology, you can have students do video trailers, you know, make a, a movie version. Um, having reading conferences with the students, having teachers sit down one-on-one -on -one for a few minutes each day, um, and hearing about what the child has to say about the book. And then as Chris referenced also, do, having the kids do book talks, you modeling the book talks as a teacher. Um, again, those are ways just to see, are they really understanding what's going on without making it like a test. And really, my last piece here is, for me, what I found last year and this year doing this, that we found ways to actually bring the independent reading books into the classroom in terms of the structured books that we're teaching. And there are two different activities that I've done. One of them, actually, Heather um, had modeled for us at a PD workshop. And it had to do with doing a formal like mini lesson on diction or on voice or on uh, tone. And so you model. Then you have the students actually go into their independent books and pull out a passage and then share that passage with a peer and the peer would have to guess what the tone of that is or uh, what language in that was particular to create meaning for the book. So you're reinforcing skills you're practicing formally in class with their independent reading books which really makes them see, oh wow, the skills I'm learning in class are transferring to these books um, that, I'm, that I'm doing just for enjoyment. And in a similar vein, characterization study, you can teach um, traits of characterization in your formal text and then you can have them apply that to their independent reading. So hopefully we gave you a little glimpse into this idea of whether or not you can assess, and it's going to move into some more conversation about community um, from Christina. So Christina, to you. Christina, can you unmute your mic, please? Sorry. <laughs> can you hear me now? Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So I'm Christina. I teach uh, ninth and 10th grade English at the high school, and this is my favorite part to talk about, the um, community piece. So one of the most beautiful things about the independent reading program is that if you commit to it, if you implement it in your classroom, you're going to see a really wonderful growth in community um, that happens really naturally. So it's going to overlap with some of what you heard already from Cindy, from Chris, from Jen, and from Heather. So um, the community happens really by talking and sharing about what we're reading. So um, giving students so many opportunities to write, reflect, to journal about what they're reading, and then to talk about it, to share. Um, so it's not just we're reading for 10 minutes and then we're moving on. It's really making it part of the, the everyday and building community from that. Um, so get them excited about the projects that they're doing. Get them to share them with the class. So if you see on that slide, um, in my bookcase you have another art project like Cindy was talking about where students created art and they shared it with the class. And I, the students shared that piece of art. Uh, in the next class, someone came in and was like, wow, that painting is awesome. And we got to talk about the book just because the piece was sitting there. So it's going to happen um, really naturally when that becomes part of your community. Chris mentioned the turn and talk. That's one of, I think, the greatest teaching tools. Give students a few minutes after the 10 minutes of free reading to talk about what they are reading, to talk about characters they like, they don't like, favorite part. Maybe you focus it, maybe you don't. Um, I've also set it up as speed, re uh, uh, speed dating, so give students face-to-face -face with uh, a student in class to talk about their book and then move them on to another student. So in that process, they're learning how to talk about books like real readers do, and they're starting to cultivate a list of books that they might want to read next. Um, I think many of us also try to steal time before and after class for conversations with students. So maybe as they're coming into class, as they're packing up, as they're putting their Chromebooks back in the cart, what are you reading? How's it going? 
Um, if it's a book I've read, I'll be like, have you gotten to this part yet? But making those connections the way we talk about books with our own friends. I had a book club last night with my friends, and it was cool to see that same dynamic that I try to create with my students. So the community can happen um, in person, in class, but it can also happen online. Our school district uses Schoology at the high school level, um, and so as some other teachers have mentioned, we all use discussion boards on there so students can share what they're reading in book reviews or on the discussion boards. Many of us also use Goodreads both for ourselves, so with other teachers. I love at the high school that I can see what everyone else is reading, can see the reviews of it. I grow my own um, list of books that I want to read next. A lot of us participate in the Goodreads challenge, so it can be a little fun competition to see who's reading and what they're reading. Um, but use it with your students. Have students post book reviews. Have students share what they're loving, comment on each other's book reviews, and again, really cultivate that list of what they want to read next. Um, one of my favorite, favorite parts uh, that has happened because of um, independent reading is that we've started a school book club. So my second year into teaching, two freshmen approached me and, and said, can't believe we don't have a book club at the high school, can we start one? And I was so floored by their initiative um, and didn't have any anticipation of where it was going to go, but of course I said, yeah, let's do it. Uh, it's a completely student-run initiative, so we've grown from a team of two students to now a team of five students. Um, we have planning meetings where we talk about questions for the book. We come up with Google Slides presentations. Um, so student-generated questions, sometimes we'll talk about, you know, is there a current event that we can connect to? Can we get an interview with the author? Or can we um, show a book trailer so we can talk about the difference between the adaptation of the book and the film? Um, but it's really run by students. Um, the first meeting of our book club, we talked about the fault in our stars. Um, and we invite teachers, we invite administrators to come. And I had to tell my students that the superintendent was going to come to this first meeting. Uh, and these two freshman students led the meeting so beautifully. It was a full packed house, um, standing room only with students and teachers in there, um, but blown away at the conversation that happened at the book club because students are excited to talk about what they're reading. Um, we made it really cozy, just like you would do with your friends. So we have students bring um, snacks and tea. We make tea. Um, we've also had the opportunity to have an author come in and speak. We had Elizabeth Laban, who wrote the tragedy paper, come and spend our lunch period with our book club, and students were able to talk to her about the writing process and about characters um, and ask really great questions. We try to do a range of books, just like you've heard from other teachers about you know, guiding students in their choices. We try to choose a range of books that is going to reflect different interests and abilities. So we've done young adult books like We Were Liars. Um, we've done The Circle, The Glass Castle, I'll Give You the Sun. So it's a real nice range. And again, I think having students, giving students the opportunity to have conversation with each other um, and with their teachers and administrators in a way that doesn't always happen in the classroom is really nice. So getting them to see us as, uh, as real readers as well. Um, we also, are, this week, are actually going to take the book club students on a field trip to Penguin Publishing, so really excited to give them a look into what the book world is like. We've also gone to BookCon as a club, so again, so many opportunities to make reading real for them. Um, and at the end, it's all really about sharing. So um, Una Abrams, one of our teachers, has started Shelfie Wednesday, which some of you may be fam familiar uh, with from Twitter. But instead of taking a selfie, you take a shelfie of the book that you're reading, and you get to talk about um, what you like about this book. and um, you know, give recommendations. So we have a group on Schoology that um, every Wednesday there's dialogue and it involves teachers across all different departments. So it's not just English teachers, it's making these connections and um, having us talk about uh, what we read and what we're loving. Um, we have, as you saw, very visible signs of reading happening at our school from the Media Center's presentations of books that change, uh, I think, monthly uh, with different recommendations to the graffiti walls that teachers will put up. Um, our school nurse, Carol Pace, is one of our biggest readers, uh, and I love that she's become kind of a hub for reading, so students will go to her for a quiet place to read during the day. She always has books on her desk. She's always talking about what she's reading. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know that everyone at our high school, everyone at our middle school, is reading something, teachers, students, administrators, and you can have a conversation with anyone about what they're reading at any time. And Heather is going to talk about um, where we've come so far. Okay, so I'm tweeting out um, a video from The Pulse, which is our student news broadcast that you can all see um, watch later so you can get our student perspective on it. Um, our kids talk about why they love independent reading and how it's been helpful to them. So um, feel free to watch that later. That's three years of work and three years of reading, and um, so we're so excited to bring their perspective um, into it as well. 
So we just want to say thank you for joining us today. We're closing out now. Um, thank you to Jen and Chris and Cindy and Christina um, for participating. Thank you, um, uh, presenting, excuse me. And then thank you to our participants. We did have some questions on Twitter that we weren't able to address. So I'll go back. Susan, I know you had a question about whole class novels and how you continue to incorporate that. So I will address that um, after we get done here. And we just also want to thank the Ed Collab and Chris Lehman for this opportunity to present to you today. In Enjoy the rest of the day. It's a fantastic day. Don't stay all the way to the end because Kate Roberts and Maggie are amazing presenters. So you want to make sure that you hang in there all the way through. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Happy reading. All right. Um, thank you the, to the Chatham teachers for those practical and wonderful trips, uh, to tips on bringing independent reading to the classroom. Um, just for the rest of you who are still out there, um, we have a wonder. We have lots of wonderful workshops coming up. Um, we have workshop number six by Kristen Zimke and Katie Muteris talking about uh, amplifying digital education for today and tomorrow. We have workshop number eight, Rasul Al Rubail and Molly Pura talking about um, re-energizing struggling for re-energizing re reading and writing for struggling learners and workshop number seven Rosalind Linder and Chris Linder talking about creating details and elaborating and adding ideas when writing um, workshop number nine is Catherine Hale and Kelly Perman um, talking about writing through blogging so I hope you will catch one of those and join us in our next session um, until then thank you all and do stay with us